Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and I apologise that I can't be there in person today. Um, just poor diary management on, on, on my part. But thank you very much for inviting me uh, to talk to you this afternoon. Um, in the sort of 20 minutes or so I've got, I want to really talk a little bit about um, what Wellcome Trust is doing in this open research. particularly interested in. So just to set uh, the context, um, in case you don't know what Welcome is, we are uh, an independent research funder with a very grand mission to improve health. Uh, we have a significant research spend. We are committed to spending around about a billion pounds sterling a year for the next five years, so about five billion spend. And our main support um, for it is research in the life sciences, but we also support uh, research in humanities, social sciences, and public engagement. So that's who Welcome is. And I, I head up a, uh, uh, an open research team, uh, and part of our mission is to try to ensure that the, the research outputs which arise from our funding uh, can be accessed and used in ways that that maximizes their their benefits and by food materials and, and, and so forth and we genuinely believe that by making these outputs widely available I think it can help accelerate discovery um, ensure that findings can be validated and, and reproduced and more generally seeks to just increase the efficiency in the whole sort of research process. If someone else has already done a piece of research and found out that it doesn't work, well it's better that is shared than we fund someone else to do exactly the same experiment to reach exactly the same conclusions. And as I say, we, um, we, we recently managed to uh, persuade Welcome to establish a dedicated team, um, of the Open Research Team, which I have the pleasure of leading to really take this work forward. And as I say, we, we talk about not just publications, but it is around sharing of, of all outputs. And I think the key thing we've done recently is one, we've made the output management plan more holistic. So we've moved from being a data sharing plan to an output sharing plan. And secondly, we, we explicitly commit to um, reviewing a plan at the point of an application. So if a researcher uh, you know, indicates they're gonna generate uh, outputs which are of broader use to the community, we require that researcher to uh, develop a plan up front indicating how they think those outputs will be shared and crucially we commit to funding uh, that plan so if they need whatever they can build that into their grant application and those costs are considered, they're publicly allowable costs, and those costs are considered along with all the other elements of the grant application at the, at the review stage. So that's output sharing uh, more broadly. I want to talk mainly about open access to research publications, as I was asked to. And I won't labour this, but we've had a, a mandatory open access policy in place for, for more than a decade, which requires our research be made available at the time of publication, or in any case within six months of publication. And the, the graph to the right, uh, my right anyway, shows the, the level of compliance with our policy. And in essence, what we do is we go into PubMed, our research is all in the life sciences, mainly in the life sciences. Uh, we go into PubMed, find out what research has been attributed to Welcome, and then look to see how many of those articles are freely available from PubMed Central, within our uh, maximize, within our six month embargo period. And what we see is that around about 80, 82% of our research um, is made open in line with that requirement. So the open access policy is sort of there and working. Um, but one of the things we're obviously very conscious of is that it does cost. And this is a, a chart, I don't expect to read these numbers, but what it's trying to show here is that publishing in 
fully open access journals is a lot more cost effective than publishing in hybrid journals where we see the the average article processing charge for a hybrid is over two thousand pounds whereas for fully open access it's it's less than fourteen hundred pounds so we are very conscious of the costs uh, and are looking at ways in which we might seek to manage those uh, going forward but more broadly well, i think what we what we've been trying to do over the past sort of number of years is really provide our researchers <clears throat> with a whole range of, of different publishing opportunities. And what I really want to spend a bit of time this morning is talking about our new uh, publishing platform, Welcome Open Research, which actually by coincidence celebrates its first birthday today. So I've got some data showing you the time it takes to publish them and, and so forth. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, just to reiterate that we obviously continue to fund fully open access publication costs. So that is in hybrid and fully open access. And a little bit towards the end about how we're really uh, becoming a very strong supporter of preprints and encouraging our researchers uh, to disseminate uh, preprints as soon as they are ready for sharing. But I want to spend just a few minutes on our new platform, Welcome Open Research, and really describe the, the motivations for establishing this and what the evidence of the first year has shown us. And maybe, maybe encourage research funders in Finland to consider developing a, a, a similar platform. So why do we establish this? Well, I think there are, there are five main reasons. Um, the first and the, probably the single biggest driver was when we spoke to the researchers, their biggest problem with the current traditional publishing model is that it's too slow. You know, the classic joke that you can you can have a baby in the time it takes to to publish an article. You know, it takes nine months from submission to publication. We want to do it faster. And this is a piece of data we're sharing today, which shows that for the first 100 papers which have uh, been submitted on the platform, published on the platform, reviewed and indexed in PubMed Central, in indexed in PubMed and Ad Central. The average time for that entire end-to-end -end process um, whether we'll maintain those fees, I can't guarantee, but at the moment, 45 days, the average time from, the, from when you hit the submit button to when it's discoverable through PubMed and haven't been reviewed, is just uh, about, uh, what's that, seven or eight weeks. Um, no, six or seven weeks, isn't it? So very, very quick. The second sort of driver was around transparency. And one of the, one of the features of this platform, which is quite unique, is that it, it uses a post-publication peer review model. And that explains why publication is also fast. Peer review happens after publication. But it's also a publication platform in which the reviews are completely transparent. So if you get invited to review and you accept that invitation to review a paper, the review you write, you have to share on the platform and you have to put your name against it. And what we're seeing um, you know, is that A, this is happening, um, but I think because researchers are having to put their name against it, these reviews are, are very detailed and they're very considered. And one of the concerns, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the concerns I had early on was well, whether reviews would be, whether they would start becoming sort of quite anodyne. And you know, it's like when you look on, on Amazon and you're trying to buy some, can you re read the reviews? And it always talks about how good the packaging is. And you think, well, I don't really care about the packaging. What's the product like? And I was worried we would get something similar um, on this platform. But we, I think that's partly because you as a researcher, if you're reviewing this, you're putting your name against it, and therefore it's your reputation. So if you if you say, yeah, this paper's great, and you haven't really reviewed it, another reviewer say, well, actually, no, it's fundamentally flawed. The, the findings are not borne out by the, the data, doesn't support the conclusions, then that ad adversely affects you. So it's a very, very transparent process. And as you can see on that screen grab, uh, re reviewers uh, can sort of give a tick to indicate they're happy with it, they can give a question mark to say, well, they're happy-ish, but it needs a bit more work. Or they can give a cross and say, no, I don't think this is up for it. Um, and they effectively reject the paper. 
Reject is an odd concept because the paper's already been published. Once they have a sort of past peer review, and that means they get uh, either two ticks or they get one tick and two question marks. So a paper with two crosses, for example, would not get indexed in PubMed. We're also very keen on reproducibility. And one of the things we require on a platform is that articles have to have a data availability statement, which makes it clear where this data can be accessed from. Not all data has to be open. If you're sharing data, if you're reporting on data which relates to, say, clinical trial, then we think it perfectly right and proper that that data may be behind a, a data access committee. But in either case, the paper must indicate how a researcher can access it if it's a click of a button or how they could access it if they have to go through a, a committee. The other thing we were keen to ensure was that it shouldn't just be about the final research article, but we should encourage the publication of all the artifacts of research. So that includes the protocol, the data notes, the software studies, the statistical reports, the um, null and negative results. So anything a researcher wishes to share should be public, should be made available through this platform. And in the first year, I'm pleased to say that around 40% of the content we are publishing um, has been classified as content other than a research article. So definitely the majority of papers are the classic research article, but 40% are other things, including you know, study protocols, uh, method papers. And we've got about half a dozen papers which are specifically tagged as null or negative results, which was something again we were keen to encourage. And then the final driver was, Really, does publishing really need to be this expensive? And we wonder whether this platform could be a, a more cost-effective way of, of publishing. And the answer to that is, at the moment, unequivocally, yes. The average uh, fee we're paying for publication on this platform is just shy of £800. And that compares with an average cost of over £2,000 uh, for our open access publications. There's no great surprise here. Because obviously it, there is no editorial review taking place. The researcher, the welcome funded researcher, decides what they wish to publish. And it is published. Once it's, it goes through a series of, of very simple checks, we make sure the paper's not plagiarized, we make sure the data's there, we make sure all the authors are on the paper and so forth. But that initial stage, no one is reviewing the paper to determine whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, or whether it's impactful or anything. The paper is simply published and the review happens post-publication. And because you remove all that editorial aspects of it, the cost can, can be significantly lower. So this is proven to be a very cost-effective platform. And what I think we've been most pleased with um, is that where we led, others have followed. Um, so only last week, the Gates Open, the Gates Open Research, the platform developed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, started publishing its first papers. Um, the first public funder, um, Health Research Board in Ireland have announced they're building a similar platform. And only yesterday, the African Academy of Sciences uh, announced they were building a platform to support researchers on the African continent. So we're starting to see a rise of these, of these platforms, not just welcome, but across the, across the board more generally. And I mentioned, so that's my welcome to open research. I want to talk about preprints as we see that as another really important way in which research can be disseminated a very fast way. And really the difference between a preprint and Welcome Open Research is that once a researcher submits to Welcome Open Research, that is where that article stays. So on publication, it gets a citation, it gets a DOI, and the article can't then be moved to Nature or any other journal on the planet. It stays, it can be published once and it published on Welcome Open Research. We recognize that not every research researcher wants to publish on that platform at this stage. There's all the issues around prestige and will that affect my ability to get um, tenure and promotion and so forth. Uh, but because the other publication models are not as fast, we uh, actively support the sharing of preprints as a way of, of, of speeding that up. And one thing we have done to encourage that is to explicitly say that when you're applying for a welcome grant, you can now cite a preprint in that grant application. 
And obviously at that point, it hasn't been peer reviewed. So we have to give uh, more information to our panel reviewers and we're on that, that, you know, this information has not been validated by the peers. Indicate to the, to the panel and to the review committees, their most up to date thinking them their latest research. So it's something we're actively uh, supporting. So what are we doing next? Um, I think the biggest thing we plan to do is actually look at our open access policy. We haven't, it, so we developed it over a decade ago. We made some changes in 2012 where we extended it to cover books and monographs, and we sort of made our, our license requirements a lot tighter. But I think even in the, in the last five years, there's been significant changes. Uh, we've seen the, the, the rise of preprints. Um, we've seen new platforms come online. And I think the other thing we've noticed is really that this sort of transition, which we believed a hybrid was going to facilitate, you know, transition publishers from flipping from a subscription to a fully open access model, we're seeing relatively little evidence that that transition is taking place. So we think the time is now right to look again at our policy and determine whether it should change, and if so, how should it change? So it's a whole piece of work we're going to take forward over the next sort of six to nine months with the aim of aim being that we'll publish an update. If we change it, we'll publish an updated policy um, late summer 2018. And then just some thoughts on how I think how sort of publishing the ecosystem might evolve in the in the future. So, and obviously I'm speaking primarily from a life sciences perspective. Um, I genuinely believe that that preprinting will become uh, much more of an established practice. At the moment, I describe it as um, akin to a minority sport. I mean, if you look at the content which was preprinted in say 2016, only about that represents probably less than 2% of the content which was indexed by PubMed. So there's a huge, huge volume of materials uh, content which is not being preprinted. Uh, I think that that I think that will change. But I think there's a huge education piece around reassuring researchers that making a preprint is not going to damage the chances of you seeking publication in a in a branded journal downstream, and it's not going to impact your um, Ability to, to get a grant and so forth, and in you know conversely, conversely, it may actually increase your opportunity to to get a grant because you can cite your most recent outputs. So I think preprint will become standard. I think we will move to a much more open, transparent peer review model. I think what we've shown through our global research and what Gates will show and others will show is that it is a a safe way of share a, a safe way to disclose your peer review reports. Um, Obviously, we don't, but there is some review of a, of a peer review report we've published. So if anyone published something which was slanderous or libelous or just downright rude, we would go back to the reviewer before we publish that. But I think what we're seeing is that, you know, reviews are, you know, trying to be helpful. And that's really what peer review is all around. It is about trying to make the research better. And I think what we're seeing is on the platform is that this is clearly what's happening. And I think it makes sense to do that discourse in a, in a public space. And obviously provide opportunity for researchers to respond to that and produce new versions to accommodate the requests from from reviewers. I think what we will start to see, and I don't think we've seen any real evidence this of this yet, is that as more content gets published and the reviewers are simply reviewing content on the basis of, you know, are the conclusions born out. I think what we'll, what we'll start to see is that overlay journals will start to be developed. So more content will be published in an open way, but because we're all time poor, we will expect and require other people to provide services for us, curation services, which sort of highlight the best papers and why they're the best papers. And I think that's a, definitely a, a function I can imagine some of the learning societies um, become much more involved with. And I think we'll start to see, you know, I think we've said this many years, but I genuinely think we're on the cusp of seeing this now of what articles moving away from this static PDF, which is simply a, a representation of the physical print artifact. And I think we will start to see article article becoming much more dynamic and actionable. And you're already starting to see that eLife are developing something called the reproducible document stack, which will enable 
you know, a reader, another researcher, to play with the variables, to run the code in their, on their own uh, environment to make sure they can produce similar results and so forth. And I think generally, I think we're going to move away from sort of publications becoming the, the major currency of the realm to one in which data is becoming the, the important thing. Um, so I hope I've kept time um, and I'm happy to try to answer any of your questions. But thank you for your thank you for listening. And um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So any uh, questions uh, or comments? Silence. Silence, <laughs> silence here. It seems that you've kind of, um, well, there's a, there's a question, one question coming. We are getting the mic to the... Hello, my name is Ella Bingham. I come from Aalto University, Finland. Um, some, one detail I perhaps did not understand. You showed the APC charges of your authors. So how come they are, the APC charges are lower than, than on average? Is, is, the, is there something that you have agreed with the publishers or how does it go? Uh, so I'm not sure I understand. you mean why are the charges lower on the Wokwek research platform? Sorry, what, uh, uh, in, in your no, slide no. regarding these article processing charges, you, you had a table where the APC charges <coughs> related to your uh, to, to the publications that are funded by your fund are lower than than the APC charges of the authors in general. Or maybe I, I didn't understand it. Um. I don't know if you can still hear me, but I can't. I can't hear the question. Oh, okay. Uh, it was can you, a. Can you repeat it? It was a question about uh, APCs, and if I got it correctly, it seems your sh your charts seemed that the costs um, were lower for those who received funding from from the Wellcome Trust than the other writers. Uh, did we interpret the chart correctly? Or, or okay, can so you explain the disparency there? Yeah, so I, I, showed, a couple of, uh, I showed a couple of numbers. So let me, let me just explain what those numbers were. So um, every year, so how we fund open access is that we, we Wellcome Trust give block grants to institutions where our researchers are based and each year at the end of each year they effectively do an audit and they say you know thanks for the million pounds you gave you've given us we spent it this way and we do an analysis of that and that shows us that on average we are paying over two thousand uh, pounds per article so on average there are obviously some very cheap publishers and there's some very expensive publishers but on average we're paying about £2,000. Uh, all I was trying to show was with the Welcome Open Research model, uh, because it's a very, very different publication model, the APCs are It seems that we are losing losing your voice voice now, so we can see you, but we cannot hear you. Okay, all right. Well, Sounds better now, but there are still some hiccups with the technology. All right. Well, I can only apologize for that. Um, but thank you for no your time anyway. Thank you for visiting us via video. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good time. I hope the meeting goes well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.